special welcome to any who may be with us as visitors today. We gather in worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Christ is risen. Alleluia. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Jesus said, this is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been offered for us. Therefore, we come to celebrate the festival. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith with a sincere and a true heart. Merciful God, our maker and our judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in your life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord.
gracious God, who sent Jesus, the Good Shepherd, to gather us together. May we not wander from his flock, but follow wherever he leads us, listening for his voice and staying near him until we are safely in your fold to live with you forever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Now, since Lydia was near Joppa, the disciples, who heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him with the request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put them all outside. And then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up, and then he gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and the widows, he showed her to them to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. For the word of the Lord.
A reading from the Revelation of John. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, all robed in white with palm branches in their hands. And they cry, cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders, the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped the God singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these robed in white, and where have they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you're the one who knows. And then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to the springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. For the word of the Lord.
be with you. And also with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Saint John. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe, because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. For the Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my lips and the meditations of all our thoughts be with you, Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Tomorrow, pre-polling booths will be opening around Australia for an election of members of our federal parliament in the House of Representatives and the Senate. For some time now, for many of us perhaps a bit too long, the people of Australia have been encouraged to make a decision. Who to vote for? Election campaigns may be exciting for some, tedious for others, 
and to speak frankly my own experience as I pour over the offerings of the media has often been one of disappointment. Disappointment in the presentation of some of the candidates as well as in the way some of the journalists approach their task of reporting the campaign. Doesn't seem to me to be helpful to view the campaign simply as some kind of boxing match between two blokes. The concentration of the two leaders of the major parties on the, on the two leaders of the major parties as if we were electing a president of a republic may perhaps be an imitation of the way of, they do, way of doing things elsewhere. And there is more to know, surely, than trivialities relating to the leaders as if we were waiting to see them trip up and count them out of the match. Where in all this are the issues of policy which electors need to help them make their decisions? Nevertheless, the task of an any elected parliamentarian is an honourable one and we should be grateful for the hard work of our representatives in Parliament and in their electorates. We should be grateful that we live in a democracy, a democracy that expects every eligible citizen to vote or at least to participate to the extent of turning up to vote. And my criticism of the overwhelming focus on the two leaders of their respective parties is not an attempt to deny the importance of leadership as such, whether in the state or in the church. This day, the fourth Sunday of Easter, Good Shepherd Sunday, is also known in some churches as Vocation Sunday because Jesus, the Good Shepherd, is the one who calls his disciples to follow him. A vocation and its Germanic equivalent, a calling, both have as their basic meaning a voice or a sound. When, for instance, the psalmist sings of deep calling to deep, he's referring to the roar that the oceans make when the waves are high. By and large, the people of Israel weren't a seagoing folk, and the Hebrew scriptures frequently suggests that the oceans are to be feared with something like holy dread. All your waves and breakers have gone over me. That is to say that it is really God who is the one speaking and acting in the storm. For the Hebrew, the voice of God may mean the destruction or deliverance. In either case, when God speaks, humans need to take notice. In the Christian writings of the New Testament, we read of the calling of the people as in our Gospel readings from chapter 10 of St. John's Gospel during the Easter season. We read of the intimate relation of Jesus with his disciples. And in this morning's reading, he is seen in, on, uh, under, around, through St. Solomon's portico in, on a winter's day in Jerusalem. The crowds have gathered for the Feast of Dedication, that day of rejoicing as the people of Israel remember the reconsecration of the temple. Because when the Maccabees had liberated them from the Syrian king Antiochus Epiphanes in 165 BC, the sanctuary could then be sanctified from its pollution which, has been, which had been caused by the sacrifices to the Greek Olympian gods and the ban on all Jewish customs. So here we are in the portico. Jesus is surrounded by a hostile circle of Jewish leaders demanding to know whether he would claim to be the Messiah. How long will you keep us in suspense, they say. Literally, the Greek for, Greek for that question would be something like, how long are you taking away our life? 
but several commentators noting the context of hostility in the situation suggest a translation such as, how long will you keep on annoying us? In reply, Jesus refers to the works he has performed. They are, he implies, testimonies of his essential nature. He then declares that they, the Jews, don't believe him because they aren't his sheep. Now for a modern reader, this is one of the hard sayings in John's Gospel. For one of the most recent commentators of the Gospel, David Ford, this statement raises issues of human freedom and divine freedom. And whether, in view of the fact that as he says later, you did not choose me, but I chose you, believing is then simply a matter of divine predeterminism. Ford prefers to read such texts as strong appeals to readers to make sure that they decide or continue to decide for Jesus. He adds that a determinist reading makes nonsense of John's purpose in writing the gospel. The close relationship between Jesus and his disciples is then declared. His sheep are known by him, they follow him, they are given eternal life, and they will never perish. Then, the essential unity of the Father and Son are affirmed. For the sheep have been given to him by the Father. They are thereby kept safe from predators. Nothing can snatch them away from the Father's hands. For the Jewish leaders, as they surround Jesus in the portico, this is the culminating blasphemy. As Jesus makes his final defense of the flock that Jesus had been caring for his f caring for. His final announcement, I and the Father are one. So the leadership of Jesus, the Good Shepherd, straddles the great paradox of the Incarnation, the taking of human being by the Divine Son. Jesus is at once the one who comes from above, the one also who has emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, even as far as the cross on Calvary. But the resurrection of Jesus is a victory over death. A member of my religious community, a dear friend, uh, Eric Maskell, of the, my community of the oric, oratory, oratory, oratory of the Good Shepherd, who's now departed this life, he used to complain about theology in some of our hymns. He particularly disliked the children's hymn, I think when I read that street sweet story of old, when Jesus was here among men, how he called little children like lambs to the fold, I should like to have been with him then. He suggested, Eric suggested, it would be more realistic to sing, I'm glad that he is here with me now. During the last week of morning and evening prayer, we've been praying the collect for the third week of Easter, which prays for the effects of the resurrection to be active in the lives of the faithful. Gracious Father, we prayed, who in your great mercy made glad the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord, give us such awareness of his presence with us that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life and serve you continually in righteousness and truth. So the risen, ascended, glorified Christ is with us still as the comforting good shepherd and those who are called to be leaders in the church and in the state, should they so choose, 
may be strengthened and guided in their own tasks. The model of the shepherd in the Gospels may also guide them. To be leaders who hear the voice of their people under their care. To know those with whom they have to do by name and to be at their service for the good of the whole community. Now the church's own parliament, the General Synod of the Anglican Church of Australia, will be gathering soon for some postponed debates. And they represent, of course, people from all around the country. I fear that this synod will be a factional and perhaps fractured meeting, tearing the church apart, chiefly over the topic that seems to obsess some elements in the church, sex. I think we should all keep our representatives in mind as they go through what may be a hurtful and disrespectful synod. We might also pray for ourselves, for leaders inside and outside the church, that they may be patient, that they may take time to listen to opposing views and be willing to hold those differing opinions for as long as it takes, speaking the truth in love to their brothers and sisters. Let us together affirm the faith of the Church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became a true human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come.
Let us pray for the world and for the church. Good shepherd of your sheep, your flock from every tribe and nation, hear our prayers for the world. We pray for leaders of nations and all who govern. First, however, for those First Nations peoples and their elders here in Australia who consider that the land, the country, owns them and that we are here as its guardians rather than its owners jurisprudence extraordinaire. Secondly, for all our peoples of Australia are about to select a new parliament, help us in our decision on election day to follow the principles of your new covenant, Good Shepherd, to vote for all our neighbours, our, each of us, our one moment to govern for the good of all rather than for ourselves. And thirdly, for all the leaders of the world, particularly those who wish to assert their physical dominance over their neighbours, rather than doing unto those neighbours as they would expect those near neighbours would do unto them, especially just now in Ukraine and in Myanmar. We pray for all of those who are thus walking through that valley of the shadow of death, and from the subsequent famine and disease there, and indeed across the world, may they fear no evil. Bring you life to all who live in such soul-destroying circumstances. Loving God, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Good shepherd of your sheep and saviour of your flock, you search out the lost and rejoice to bring them home. Hear our prayers for your church, its clergy, and people worldwide. And here, in the Anglican cycle of prayer, of, of a prayer today for the Anglican Church of Australia, the prime, the primate Archbishop Jeff Smith, the General Secretary Anne Hayward, the, the General Synod and Office Staff, and the General Synod and Standing Committee and particularly here at St. James, for our fathers Andrew, John, Glenn, and Ron. For those commissioned to find us a new rector, and for all of those many who contribute to make our gatherings here so joyous. Joyous and splendid indeed is the spectacle of our gatherings but encourage us not to be just spectators of the beauty here, but also let us not fail to be that which you teach. Refresh our souls and open our ears to hear your voice and encourage us to follow your lead. Loving God, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Good shepherd of your sheep, you know your flock and call each of us by name. Hear our prayers for the community in which we live. We pray for all of those whom we love and for those whom we share our daily life and for the homeless, the hungry and the unwanted. Send us to be shepherds to your lost and lonely ones. Loving God, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. Good shepherd of your sheep, you go with your flock on the darkest and most dangerous paths. Hear our prayers for all in need, for those in places of grief, despair and loneliness, for those who are sick or in pain and infirmed. Especially now, for Boma Bouya, Father Jeff Humble, Father Robert Collings, Terry Knight, Colin Dunstan, Johan Nell, Ruth Jones, Anne Ryan,
Francis Rolfe, Peter Rinnick, Sister Jeanette Fox, Katie Richardson, Joyce Smith, Thelma Steele, Campbell Walton, Elliot, John Gillim, Graham Cooksley, Oliver Peck, Nicholas Lee, Christine Cate, and Julia Collis, and Nadida Alraj. Help us to soothe the afflictions of those who suffer. Loving God and your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Good Shepherd, Lamb of God, you guide your flock to the waters of eternal life where none shall perish. Hear our prayers for those who have found their rest with you. We remember those of this parish who have gone before us, and especially now for those who have recently departed. Bishop Philip Newell, Catherine Mulder, Frank McGrath, Shirley Llewellyn Jones, and Michael Mulder. May we so follow you in life, in death that may come with your, come with your saints in every nation and tribe to the place of everlasting gladness you have prepared for us. Loving God, in your mercy. Yeah. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have promised to hear our prayers. Grant that what we have asked in faith we may, by your grace, receive through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We are the body of Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace be with you.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. O oh, glory and honor be yours, always and everywhere. Mighty Creator, ever-living God, we give you thanks and praise for your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who by the power of your Spirit was born of Mary and lived as one of us. By his death on the cross, he offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. And now we give you thanks that you raised him to life triumphant and exalted him in glory. By his victory over death, the reign of sin is ended. A new day has dawned, a broken world is restored, and we are made whole once more. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing.
Merciful God, we thank you for these gifts of your creation, this bread and wine. And we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, we who eat and drink them may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup, and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Let us Therefore we do as our Saviour has commanded, proclaiming his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. And looking for his coming again, we celebrate with this bread and this cup his one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Renew us by your Holy Spirit Unite us in the body of your Son and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father, in songs of never-ending praise. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As this broken bread was once many grains which had been gathered together and made one bread, so may your church be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not, I am not worthy, worthy to receive you but only say the word, and I shall be healed.
Let us pray. Eternal God, giver of life, in the breaking of the bread we know the risen Lord. May we who celebrate this holy feast walk in his risen light and bring new life to all creation. Father, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Once again, I bid welcome to everyone is, who is joining us this morning, both here and also online. There are various notices in the pew sheet which I commend to you. Just a couple that I want to draw your attention to uh, this coming through this coming week. As we all know, we've had, we've seen the arts community greatly diminished in what they have been able to do over the past couple of years. So we are truly delighted to be able to introduce once again a concert from our choir, which I encourage you to support. Details are available on page 18, where you'll see the lineup of music that will be performed next Saturday evening, 5 p.m. Also next Sunday, the Institute will be having its next event, which is a tour and talk of the Sydney Jewish Museum. Details are in the pew sheet there. And also forward notice for the St. Lawrence House fundraising for this year, the big event, 2nd of June. Refreshments are to be served in the covered courtyard following this service, so please do join us. Will you please stand? God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you what is pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be, um, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia.